Revelation 21. As I said last week, I preached on the new earth, which was a new topic for me. <clears throat> and I was going to finish it this week. And so this is the new earth part two. We're going to do a little bit of review. But I want to read the text. Revelation 21. The revelation of Jesus Christ to the Apostle John. <clears throat> Verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. We'll stop right there. Listen. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And then the third time, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Woo! Hallelujah. Pray with me, please. Lord, we thank you for this time you've given us, your multiplied blessings upon our life. Lord, we pray that your word, well, we know your word goes, does accomplish its purpose. But Lord, we pray that someone might hear this word, either here or out on the internet. Lord, that their heart might be touched and that they might be encouraged if they're a Christian and their feeble knees might be lifted up and their heart might be encouraged. And Lord, those that don't know you as Lord, that you deal with them by your spirit. Speak to their hearts, Lord. And Lord, anoint us in pulpit and in pews through this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I've used almost every free minute this week in studying and I'm trying to learn more about the topic of the new earth. And in the course of that, I also have studied the different views of millennialism. You know, the millennial reign. There's the premillennial view, which is divided into two camps. The historical premillennialism and the dispensational premillennialism. And those are further divided into those that hold the pre-tribulation and those that hold the mid-tribulation position. Then there's the amillennial position and the post-millennial position. I pretty much rejected the amillennial and the post-millennial uh, views, but I'm still trying to determine which premillennial view I think is biblically most correct. I'm, just, I'm not going to preach about the millennial. I just do that and they're free. It didn't cost you nothing. Um, I must also say that whatever view Christians hold regarding the millennium or the end times in general is not something that touches our salvation. This is something that Christians talk about and Christians can study and discuss. I mean, there's great men of God that, that I really love and follow that hold the amillennial and those that hold the postmillennial and the premillennial and either camp, the, whichever camp they're in. But none of us gets it 100% right in this life. I believe Jesus and on the other side is going to sit us down and tell us where we got it right and where we got it wrong. But it doesn't touch our salvation. God is not going to keep His born-again children out of the present heaven because they had an incorrect view or understanding of the end times in the millennial reign. Uh, and I, I'll repeat again what I... what. Uh, Pastor John Riesinger, I used to follow him. He's went on to be with the Lord. But, uh, his congregation asked him why he didn't preach much about the end times and what his millennial views were. And he said, I'm a pan-millennialist. And when asked what that meant, he said, I believe as long as we're in Jesus, everything's going to pan out all right. Amen. Whichever happens, as long as we're in Jesus, it's all going to be okay. Amen. So in the way of review, we learned that the new earth is a fact that will happen. It's mentioned not just in our text in Revelation, but it's also mentioned in Isaiah 65, 17, Isaiah 66, 22, and 2 Peter 3, 13. And we saw that the new earth, that the, 
the new earth is the final eternal state, not just for God's children, but for all of creation. As Paul details in Romans the 8th chapter, he said the whole creation is groaning under bondage and awaiting its deliverance from the bondage of corruption. Romans 8 verses 21 through 23. And we also learned about the present heaven, which is also referred to in the Bible as paradise. It's where Christians go when they die. And as the Apostle Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 6 and 8. We saw that the present heaven is a temporary dwelling place where Christians will wait for the final end of all things, then come back to the earth with the Lord, where they will reign with Him, when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father, Philippians. We also learned that the present heaven is a wonderful, glorious, blessed, indescribably beautiful place. A place of perfect peace and love. A place of no sorrow, no tears, no pain. Paul described this uh, present heaven in his vision. He said, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. But the present heaven is not the final destination for God's people. The final destination is the new earth. And also, this is, this is an aside, since I'm not going to develop in this message, but, you know, we don't get our resurrection bodies until, until the final resurrection, until the end of all things, until the day of the Lord, until after the tribulation, and after the Lord has come, and He's going to resurrect the, the dead and put the souls back with perfect resurrection bodies, and we'll be changed, as 1 Corinthians 15 says, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye will be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. That doesn't happen until the resurrection. So what kind of bodies do we have in the present heaven? There's bodies because people are eating. People are, people are blowing trumpets. People are sitting on thrones. People are doing things. They're wearing robes and all and everything. And I, like I said, I'm not going to develop this. I haven't really studied it out. But Paul talks about a, a celestial body, a heavenly body. So the Lord is going to give us some kind of celestial body in the present heaven while we wait for the end of all things for our resurrection body that's like Jesus has. I also preached on why there must be a new earth. There must be a new earth because on the sixth day at the end of creation, God looked at it everything and said it is all very Good. That's Genesis 1.31. He put Adam and Eve in the garden with one commandment. Do not eat of the... You can eat of everything here, but don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said don't, and they did. God said no, and they said yes. And because of that, their bodies became subject to death, and also creation was cursed. The ground was cursed, God said, for your sake. But God's purpose in creation will be done. All things will be restored as He originally intended His creation to be. Randy Alcorn, who, who wrote the book Heaven, which I've been studying, said this, Carpenters make things and repair things. Jesus is a carpenter. Creation got broke, and He's going to fix it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Also preached on how the new earth will come to be. We learned that the Bible says that at the second coming of Jesus, also called the day of the Lord and also called the day of God, that the heavens, Peter said, will, will pass away with a great noise. And that word noise is a hissing and a whirring sound like it's made when there's an atomic explosion. And he said that the elements, the things that make up all the molecules, everything, everything is going to melt with a fervent heat. And the earth and the works thereof shall be burned up. 2 Peter 3 verse 10. And after this fiery judgment, Christ is going to restore everything as He intended it to be from His original creation when He called it very good. Also preached about when will the new earth appear. I said that the Bible says no one can give an exact date. 
Jesus, when he was here on earth, he didn't know. He said the angels don't even know. He said only the Father knows. It's when the Father says go back is when Jesus is going to come back. That's Matthew 13, verse 32. But Jesus said we're to be ready, or Paul said we're to be ready because it's going to come as a thief in the night. 2 Thessalonians 5, 2 and 2 Peter 3, 10. And Jesus said, Be ye also be ye therefore also ready, for the Son of Man cometh in an hour when you think not. Matthew 24, 44, and Luke 12, verse 40. I preach that the signs of the times are all around us. They leap out at us out of every news report as we see the devil through the socialists and the fascists and the communists and the globalists and the Green New Dealers and the great resetters of the World Economic Forum and the New World devote, uh, Order devotees and the climate change fanatics work day by day and night by night trying to set up the Antichrist system. The Antichrist system is being set up all around. In fact, it's about set up. It's all ready for everything to happen, for the Antichrist to step on the scene. And I ended last week with the reminder that the new earth is only possible because Jesus died. And he was buried. And he rose again the third day, never having to die again. Now, Elijah and Enoch and Jairus' daughter and Lazarus and the the uh, son of the woman of the uh, widow of Nain, they all were raised from the dead, but they're going to have to die again. Jesus is the only person in all creation who died and rose again and is never going to have to die again. Amen? Woo! Hallelujah to the living God. He said, I am he who liveth and is dead, and behold, and alive forevermore. Amen. Amen. And have Amen. the keys of hell and of death, he told John the Apostle in the book of Revelation. And he allowed those who are his to escape death also. He's coming back to change the bodies of the righteous living, 1 Corinthians 15, to give us a body like his, like his resurrection body, no longer subject to illness or disease or death. And he will judge the inhabitants of the earth, both living and dead, and he will judge the ungodly nations that have rejected him as Lord. And that his children will live with him forever. Enjoying all the blessings of the new earth. That's just review from last week. Again, I'm going to charge you a quarter for that when you go out. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. Our first point is, what will it be like for God's children who live on the new earth. I mean, there's a lot. But I got to think, the, the greatest and the most important thing for us as we live on the new earth is that we are going to get to see God face to face. Amen? Amen. Think about that. The oldest book in the Bible is Job. They say Job was written even before Moses wrote the first five books. And in it, Job says this, by the Spirit of God. He says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he, that He shall stand on the earth on the latter day, and though after my skin worms desire to destroy this body, yet, he says, in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, for my eyes shall behold him and not another. Though my reins be consumed within me. By the way, reins, that's an old English word for kidneys. You look it up in the, in the, in the Hebrew and it's kidneys. Kidney is a vital organ. He said, in other words, though my vital organs rot. By the way, that's what happens. Your own skin worms divide your body. <laughs> Who is our Redeemer? Who's, who's Job talked about? As a redeemer. He said, I know my Redeemer. Our Redeemer is Christ. It was Christ. It is Christ and it will be Christ. Amen. He says of himself, if you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father. So why do you say, show me the Father? John 14, 9. 
Hebrews 1.3 says, He is the express image of God. And Job says, by the Spirit of God, that Christ, who he calls my Redeemer, will stand. That means a body standing on some surface. And guess where he's going to stand? He's going to split the Mount of Olives in half. And he's going to stand, Job said, on the earth in the latter days, at the end of time as we know it. And Job will have a body, even though skin worms have devoured his flesh, his vital organs have, have rotted. And he's going to have physical eyes which, with, with, with which he can see his Redeemer. Hallelujah. And guess what? That's for me. That's for every Christian. Every person who knows God. This is the prom This is the most wonderful blessing and promise and the most wonderful feature of the new earth. Even though all this has happened, when Jesus returns to this earth at the end of time, God is going to give us new resurrection bodies like His, and we shall see Him with our physical eyes. Think about that. Woo! Hallelujah! Just to feel His touch is so wonderful. But to actually see Jesus? What will it be like on the new earth? Listen to this, as I read. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And as I said, He will dwell. He's going to live with us. He's going to come down and live with His people. And we will be His people and He will be our God. He's going to wipe away all the tears from our eyes. There's going to be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Neither any more pain. Hallelujah. Isn't that great, Margie? Neither, not a twitch of pain. Think about that. Not a twinge or twitch of pain. Hallelujah. Amen. For the former things are passed away. Revelation 21, verse 4. And he that sat upon the throne said, Write, told John, write. For these things are, these words are true and faithful. He said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will give unto him that a thirsts the fountain of the water of life freely. Amen. And he that overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he will be my son. Revelation 21, verses 6 and 7. That is what the new earth, God's children, it will be like for God's children living on the new earth. There's other questions that come to mind, such as, will we eat on the new earth? Will we need to sleep? Will we have the beloved animals that we had on the earth? Etc. All these are interesting questions that you can think about or study. Some Bible doesn't say specifically you have to kind of surmise. They can pursue and study. But they all pale in comparison to the most important fact that God will be with us forever that we will Amen. be with Jesus forever. Amen. We will be able to see Him and we will be able to experience indescribable bliss by that son about it. Joy unspeakable and full of glory, Peter said. Amen. And the songwriter added, and the half has never, yet been, has never yet been told. Secondly, other features of the new earth. This is interesting. I found this scripture. And I will make for them a covenant that day with the beasts of the field and with the birds of heaven. So there's going to be creatures and the creeping things on the ground. Hosea 2 verse 18. Isn't that interesting? Hosea. The Bible says that on the new earth animals will revert to becoming vegetarians. Did you know that? Isaiah eleven seventeen 17 says the cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lay down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The bear will have, not have a desire to leap on the cow and kill it and devour it on the new earth. The mighty lion, the king of the jungle, is going to eat straw like an ox, it says. Isaiah 65, 22 says, The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. Imagine that. Remember that cartoon where the in the morning, the uh, the the wolf, the the sheepdog would 
punch a time clock and come in and the and the coyote would be leaving and say, Hey, whatever their names were put in and they'd switch. That was funny. You know, and how the sheepdog was always frustrated and not figuring out the coyote. The wolf and the lamb gonna lay down together. Amen. The lion shall eat straw like an ox, the dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy it. All my holy mountain, says the Lord. Isaiah 65, 22. Snakes will no longer be a danger. There will be no need for snake venom to counteract the deadly bite. The Bible says the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. Isaiah 11, verse 18. Now this may be referring to the millennial period and to the new earth. I'm not sure about that, but snakes aren't going to be a danger. Amen. We'll be able to play around them. As much as I hate snakes, I'll never forget when I was fishing out in brush, started brush creeping real early in the spring and I stepped down and felt something under my foot and it was a copperhead. <laughs> but it was so cold that he was sluggish and I jerked my foot back and he went he went, and went off. You know? So we don't have to worry about that. In the Eternal day of God, 2 Peter 3.12. God shall be all in all. 1 Corinthians 15.28. He will eternally dwell with mankind in an intimate relationship of undisturbed bliss. He's not going to require any human rulers or any administrative authorities because the tabernacle of God will be with men. Paul, or Paul wrote eight, Romans 8.21 about this. He said, he was writing about the new creation. And I saw a sermon by John Piper quoting or commenting on Romans 8.21. He says this, Just as creation fall, followed fallen man into corruption, the creation fo will follow redeemed man into glory. Amen. It's interesting. Thirdly, this is a question people that I had. Will the current earth be destroyed? Well, the first place the Lord took me to was Genesis. Genesis 6, 7, God said to Noah, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Genesis 7, 11 says, The fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. Then Genesis records these words. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of was the spirit of life. All that was on the dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground with men and cattle, creeping things and birds of the air. Genesis 7 verses 22 and 23. The great flood... In the great flood, the earth was covered by a global ocean. 2 Peter 3, 6 says, The world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. The physical features of the earth were changed by the mighty hydraulic force of the water. New basins and new channels were created for lakes and rivers and seas. The land shifted and new formations such as mountains and continents were formed. Yet we're told God, quote, destroyed the earth. So although the flood in Noah's time certainly destroyed the world, what the Bible means by destruction did not mean earth's obliteration. Like it didn't exist anymore. He remade the earth, but he did not obliterate it. When 2 Peter 3.10 says, The heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, the earth and the workshops shall be burned up. That image is of the fire that comes out of God that will destroy the wreckage caused by sin. The curse on the earth. God's going to remove the curse on the earth by cleansing fire. Everything will be as God intended it at the end of that sixth day. John wrote these words in the book of Revelation. Revelation 21 5. He that sat upon the throne, behold, said, Behold, I make all things new. Hallelujah. 
And he said, write these words for they're true and they're faithful. Amen. There will be no need for a temple or a synagogue or a sanctuary or a chapel or a church building on the new earth. Because what? Because the temple is God Himself. Revelation 7.15 says, He who sits upon the throne dwells with them. The glory of God which lights up all heaven defines it as His temple. There's no need for a temple in the eternal state since God Himself will be the temple in which everything exists. The presence of God will fill the entire new earth and new heaven. And guess what? Woo! His children will be living in the limitless, beautiful, wonderful presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that for Amen. a minute. Amen. Glory to God! We will be walking and talking with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Beautiful day. Lord have mercy. Paul writes about the new creation and the new earth. He says this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. <clears throat> for the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits, what? For the revealing of the sons of God. That's why it's all going to happen. So he can restore mankind back to our fellowship with him. Amen. Romans 8, verses 18 and 19. He goes on. The creation also shall be delivered up from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberation of the children of God. See, the children of God. It's all about the children of God. Jesus said in John 17, Father, I will that those you have given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which is the glory that you gave me before the foundation of the world. Paul said, we who have the, we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, which is the redemption of our body. Verses 21 through 23. But I have to end with a warning. I don't know if you're here, if you're watching on Twitter, Gitter, Facebook, YouTube, wherever. But no one who does not know Christ in the full pardon of their sins will go into the new earth. Scripture is clear that there are only two places for souls to go in into eternity. Acts 17, 31 says, God has appointed a day wherein He will judge the world in righteousness by Jesus Christ. On that day, Jude 6 says that the apostate angels are going to be judged. Likewise, all persons who have ever lived upon the earth shall appear before the tribunal of Christ to give an account for their thoughts, their words, their deeds. And to receive according to what they've done in their body, whether good or evil. That's 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. But Christians will not be judged for sin. We were judged for sin on the cross. Amen. He took it out of the way. We will not be judged for our sins. But we will be judged for our obedience or our disobedience to Christ. For how we have used or did not use our gifts. And for the works that we did or did not do. Don't you think if you've got a gift, you ought to be using it? Should, should we seek our gift? Sometimes our gift is thrust upon us. Sometimes we have to pray about it. You know, I've told the story before about D.L. Moody, the famous 19th century evangelist out of Chicago, and a famous great church, and a man came to visit the church and and uh, Moody said he said I'd like to meet some of your leading members and Moody took him back to the church and introduced him to, to, to a little gray headed lady and introduced her and he came back and said what does she do that's so important he said 
She smiles them in and she smiles them out. That was her gift. You know, I don't know what your gift is, but we've all got a gift and we're going to be judged as to whether or not we use the gift that God gave us. It might be letter writing. It might be making a phone call. It might be intercessory prayer. It might be passing out tracts. I don't know what it is. Only God knows. Amen. But we have to, I don't know, maybe like Dorcas in the Bible, she, she sewed things for people. She made garments for people. That was her gift. She got raised from the dead, by the way, by Peter. And on this day, Jesus will manifest his mercy in the eternal salvation of the elect. That's Matthew 24, 31, Mark 13, 27, and Luke 18, 7. And his justice will be manifested in his damnation of the reprobate who are wicked and disobedience. That's in Mark 16, 16, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 12. Then all the righteous will go into everlasting life to receive the joy which shall come from being in the presence of the Lord. That's in Matthew 25, verse 34. But the wicked who do not know God, who did not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, shall be cast into eternal torments and be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Luke 16, verses 19 through 31. Lord of Lazarus and the rich man in Revelation 20 verse 15. So my prayer is I beseech you by the mercies of God to run to Christ. To throw yourself on the mercy of Christ. Shake off carnality. Shake off all the things of this world that are going to pass away. Turn your heart and mind to Jesus Christ and be watchful because you do not know the day that He is coming. It could be today. You need to be prepared to say with a redeemed heart, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Revelation 22, verse 10. Amen. Bow with me, please. Lord, we thank you for this word. We thank you, Lord, for all the things you've got in store for us. Oh, Lord, our mind cannot conceive, Paul said, but you've revealed them to us by your spirit in your word, Lord. And where would we be without your word? We wouldn't know a thing. We'd be dumber than an ox. We wouldn't know nothing without your word, Lord. But we learn in your word that we're sinners and we need a Savior. That you're a mighty Savior and you forgive sins. And Lord, you're going to take us to be with you forever if we die in the present heaven. And then we're going to be receiving resurrection bodies. Either if we're here when you come back and you, you change our bodies in a moment in the twinkling of an eye or we're, we're, we've died and you're going to give us resurrection bodies and reunite our souls with those resurrection bodies, Lord, whenever. We wouldn't know any of this if it wasn't written in your word, Lord. We thank you for your blessed holy word. Deal with every heart. Meet every need. Draw every soul unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glory. What are we going to sing, Jack? 317. 317.